you and good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you very much for the organizers um, for bringing us together in the Rhineland in winter. Um, I work for Human Rights Watch, a global NGO working on, as the name says, human rights. Um, and we, and today I'm just going to mostly focus on international standards around freedom of expression and hate speech. Um, and I'm mostly going to focus on the UN standards and how the UN's been approaching this as a global area, but then compare it briefly towards the end with the um, European Court of Human Rights, which I know you had a session on yesterday, um, and very briefly the EU um, Council Framework decision, um, which you'll be hearing more about in straight after, or the EU generally in the next session. Um, and just to say, working in an organization based in New York, um, sometimes within our organization outside, we hear um, stereotypes. One is that there's an American standard, a First Amendment, where everything is about freedom of expression, no restrictions are possible. Um, if there's any restrictions put on speech, it's an attack on liberty, and even uh, measures designed to protect minorities and the vulnerable um, from hate end up being used against those very minorities. It's one stereotype. The other, which sometimes in, in Europe, there's a great restriction on freedom of speech, but also that this um, freedom of expression model denies that um, there's real incitement that happens to hatred, which um, needs to be regulated, needs to be controlled. Um, and this often leaves out the rest of the world. In fact, I think there's some truth in both those arguments. Um, and say so the UN, the international model, has in the end tried to combine the two. Um, and that goes right back to the very beginning. In 70 years ago, um, in fact, we'll celebrate the anniversary in a couple of weeks of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, December the 10th, 1948. Um, that was the first global principle of human rights. It claimed, uh, it set out that there should be freedom of expression as a, one of the fundamental rights. It also said that states need to stop incitement to discrimination. It's one track, human rights. On the other side, before 1948, in 19, a couple of years before, in 46, was the Nuremberg trials, the trials of persons for crimes against humanity, um, and even later on um, as that uh, developed genocide. Um, but those weren't just those responsible for mass killing and atrocities. One of the key people prosecuted in the first Nuremberg trial um, was Julius Streicher, a, essentially a journalist and editor for what we now call incitement, not having incited persons to that. And in the international criminal realm, when courts have prosecuted crimes against humanity, they have prosecuted in incitement, those responsible, including journalists. And we saw that in the Rwanda um, tribunal as well with the radio station Radio Mil Colin, which incited um, um, genocide without being, if you say, directly responsible for the killing. Human rights at the UN has then backed away. It, um, that was the, the Universal Declaration was in 1948. It took into the 1960s, 1966, until you actually had treaties with legal obligations. Um, the first human rights treaty was the Treaty on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, before it. Um, and then you have the two main treaties, the covenants on civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, basically, I would say this is all an artificial distinction if you really rigidly divide them as one human rights standard. But when it comes to freedom of expression and hate speech, um, they some of those treaties address them. The Treaty on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, Article 4, has quite a strong requirement on states to prohibit incitement to racial discrimination. Uh, <clears throat> I won't go into any further on that now, just because we're talking about European standards mostly, and most a lot of European states put reservations on that, and they just say we're not going to apply the SIR, the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. But the key 
I think, is to understand UN standards is the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It famously, perhaps it's Article 19, says it requires all states to protect freedom of expression with certain limitations, which we'll come to. Um, but then the very next article, Article 20, which was largely forgotten for years, um, also requires states to take some action against what we might call hate speech today. Um, I've not got any um, slides because, um, to avoid getting too legalistic, but was a couple of um, handouts, uh, sorry, uh, links. And one of them, I would just say, is go back and afterwards, if you're interested in this, and read the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and particularly Article 20. Um, and that's one, it's because it's short, I'll read that out now. And that says, um, in Article 20, that states said, any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law. And then secondly, and this is the key one, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. So, <clears throat> That was 1966. We've heard very little since about prohibiting propaganda for war, um, which still happens quite often. But that second part is the UN's human rights prohibition of what we may call hate speech today. And I'm just reading that out one more time. Any, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. Um, so that had a lot of elements to it. What does advocacy of reli racial, religious hatred mean? And what does incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence mean? And even what does prohibited by law means? And that was separate from the prohibition of um, the protection of freedom of expression. So what impact did that have? For 30, 40 years, probably not very much because so um, it seemed a bit strange. It, what, how does this fit in with the freedom of expression model? Um, plenty of people say even those laws like that about prohibiting, prohibiting incitement to discrimination are the, exactly the type of laws that get used in repressive states against those who um, the government wishes to, to oppress, even representatives of minorities themselves. But what changed, and I'll come to it, in culminating in a doc, UN document I think is really useful in addressing this is called the Rabba Plan of Action um, from 2013. I think it's actually the very last document in the list of documents you have as a handout. Um, they're named because it was drafted in the Moroccan capital of Rabba. Um, and why did that happen? Because after 2001, after September 11th particularly, the, there was a push at the UN in the human rights Council by some states to have defamation of religion as a human right, to say it's against human rights to defame religion, religions have rights. Um, this went on for some years at the UN. A lot of states and organizations like mine push back strongly about that, say religions don't have human rights, it's a human right. Um, but in the end, the UN set up a whole set of discussions to say, how do we finally address this Article 20, the prohibition of hate speech, within a protection of freedom of expression. So the Rabbi Plan of Action came with a lot of experts, particularly on freedom of expression, but also those on protecting minorities, protecting discrimination, and agreed just a set of principles on how to states could enforce that very limited um, prohibition of advocacy to hatred, that's incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence within freedom of expression framework. And therefore, and just to summarize a couple of things, the document itself is pretty useful, but at the beginning, the then UN chief, human rights chief, um, set out some of the basic principles. Um, one, and one of the most important, is say the purpose of such laws prohibiting hate speech is to protect individuals and to protect groups of individuals. It's a human right. It's not to protect belief systems, religions, or institutions from criticism. And that's vital, is to say that this is a, the fundamental principle is 
you start with is there is freedom of expression. And freedom of expression is most important when it comes to criticizing those with power, including religions. So it, it must be possible to scrutinize, I'm quoting from it, scrutinize, criticize belief systems, opinions, and institutions, including religious ones. The one limitation is when there's certain speech which actually amounts to hatred that incites violence, etc. The other, another basic principle was, it's essential, they say, to make a distinction in law between the worst forms of expression that should be a criminal offence, that should be criminalised and should be punished. Secondly, some forms of, of expression that are not criminal and should not be criminalised, but may justify civil claims, and defamation may be one of those. And forms of expression that are not criminal or civil sanctions, but still raise concerns about tolerance, civility, and respect for others. And that last point is also critical in the wider context. I won't go into, into, into more detail. But as to say, the state's responsibility may be to criminalize very limited but certain forms of speech. Um, it may be to give legal protection to bring civil claims, but other speech may not be criminalized. It does not mean that there's still many issues around civility respect, which needs to be brought up and discussed and, um, and tolerated. Um, and then the final point, which was key, is that this can only be addressed in the context of the rule of law and a very strong independent judiciary which is able to make rulings and determinations on the law. If it's not, um, then that gives so much power to states and those in power to take action against speech they don't like, and speech that criticizes them, criticizes institutions, criticizes the armed forces in a country, etc., in the name of um, this being incitement to hatred. So that's why human rights can only be protected when it comes to law with a very strong independent judiciary. Um, so, what does this UN Rabbi Plan of Action say? It strengthens again when it comes back to the laws. And the very basic principle of human rights is you have a human right, like freedom of expression. Very few human rights are unlimited. Um, yeah, there's a total ban on the prohibition of torture. For example, torture can never be justified in, under human rights law. But all other rights, like expression, association, um, can be, in certain circumstances, limited. But only when those limitations are first legal as a basic principle of legality. So those restrictions need to be very clearly set out in law. And if it's a criminal law, it has to be so clear that anyone can predict their act would be a criminal offence. If the law is so vague, it um, won't be, um, it'd be too vague and be arbitrary. The second principle is that any restriction needs to be necessary um, and legitimate. It has to be for a very legitimate purpose, and incitement to hatred may be one of those, but it can only be in very limited circumstances. And the third principle when restricting human rights is any restrictions needs to be proportional. It can be the least restrictive possible. Um, that means that any, if it's a criminal offence, any punishment needs to be proportionate. Um, when we're talking about freedom of expression, it should not have a chilling effect. Um, and, that, and it should be that it reflects um, the limitation on on the right, say freedom of expression, is to reflect the actual need, and it needs to be the least restrictive. Um, so, and finally, and this is why I think it's worth always going to this rabbi plan of action, they also say practically, on that very limited area, but the area where it comes to criminalizing speech, because it could be incitement, um, how should states do that? And they came up this time with there's lots of numbers, but this is six tests, a six-point test that must be taken into account each time, and six issues. First issue for whether certain speech should be criminalized is context. We, I think we've heard about context already, but when it comes to this area that's sometimes called hate speech, context is key. 
Um, something said in one place at one time may have no harmful impact. But the same words said somewhere else in a different place at a different time could be very much intended to incite and, how, and incite violence or hatred. Um, so context is always key. The second issue which is key is the speaker needs to be taken into account. Who was the speaker? What was their position in society um, and in the context of the audience to whom that speech is directed? The third and really critical issue, and this is, they're talking about Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, incitement, is incitement here requires intent of the person doing it. So, in some legal terms, negligence, recklessness are not sufficient. The person responsible, if they're going to suffer criminal consequences, needed to have intended to uh, incite hatred, violence, um, discrimination. Um, the fourth issue um, to take into account is the content, the form, and the form of the speech. So obviously what's in the speech, but how it's presented um, and how it's deployed. So something said in a very sort of calm, academic way may not be incitement. Something said in a very polemic way, in a very certain circumstances, the same words may look like more in intent to incite. Um, the fifth issue is the extent of the speech. And that, by that they mean what's the reach of the speech? What's, how many people is it um, speaking to? What's the magnitude? What's the size of the audience? Um, so again, one leaflet handed out may not incite. Um, and this is probably where the social media obviously matters. Um, I'm talking about general principles here, but, and I would say the same principles on freedom of speech and hate speech as have been around for decades apply to social media. But you said it's important to consider the extent of the speech when considering is it actually incitement to violence or hatred. Um, and the final issue they look at when considering, or say states should look at when drafting laws on incitement is what's the likelihood, including the imminence, of actually inciting someone. So you need to be clear that the action, say, in violence or hatred that um, incitement does, does not actually have to happen. In some countries, incitement has to result in someone actually acting on it. Um, under the U UN um, principles, it should, doesn't have to actually result in, say, violence. But it has to have some degree of risk. And therefore, the UN principles say it should at least say there's a reasonable probability that the speech would succeed in exciting actual action against a particular group on race, religious, or other grounds. Um, Recognising that this should be somewhat direct. So it needs to be that there was at least a, a link um, and there was a likelihood that it would result in action. So those are the six principles, and again, I would recommend you go to the Rabbi Plan of Action and look at them. Um, they also say, which we're going to now, that say, of course, addressing this uh, hate speech, the law is just one part of the tools and a limited part. It by states' duties, it requires a lot more in policies, it requires a lot more um, action in many areas. Um, just before moving, just to the ECHR to say, how is, it, is, it, is this addressed? Well, sometimes you see it states at the UN on human rights, often reviewed um, by treaties bodies, and in this case, the Human Rights Committee of the UN, which reviews states' compliance with the um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. They often bring up concerns, but I just want to give a practical example of where um, the UN has said a state was failing, and that was with the European state recently, was the United Kingdom. And um, so the Human Rights Committee and others have said, there's, obviously there's a lot of speech in the UK media in the last few years and from some politicians, um, which has been raising, concern, let's say, concerns, 
um, hatred about immigrants and other members of minority communities. Again, we recognize as a freedom of speech, um, particularly, you might say, for media and for polit politicians, but occasionally, sometimes, if the UN has said this has crossed the line and the state, the United Kingdom, has failed to take sufficient action. And there was actually quite a good speech by um, Zaid, the former UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, about one concrete example where he said a article in the Sun newspaper, which is the most popular newspaper in the United Kingdom, by a columnist called Katie Hopkins, which was um, at the time of um, migrant boats in the Mediterranean from Libya and elsewhere. But this was so polemic and um, <coughs> that it was talking of calling them cockroaches. Um, cockroaches, you know, has a history from used by people like Julius Stryker in the 1930s and by Radio Milkulin about in Rwanda to promote hatred. And this article recommended sending not rescue ships, but warships to sink the ships in the Mediterranean. And <clears throat> that's the case, polemic, perhaps not intended, but the outcome of this article, given all those contexts we were talking about, that it's the going to millions of people at a time of um, great controversy, and the language used there seemed to cross the line into um, incitement. And again, he's talking about the responsibility of the state of the United Kingdom, and his objection was not that nobody was prosecuted, just that there wasn't even investigated, and saying this is at least a situation which warrants an investigation. And Zayed also, but that's why his speech is pretty good, because it also very much says this is a freedom of expression issue. He starts off by saying the basic issue is freedom of expression, and that goes for the media as well, particularly for the media. But there are certain circumstances where a state needs to take responsibility and say, in, in some cases, there might be cross the line into incitement to hatred and even to violence. Okay, I'm just briefly now, that's a UN standard. And it's, I think it's got somewhere, after years of not neglecting it, trying to balance this issue between the state's duty to address some forms of hate speech, but within, and this is critical, the context of freedom of expression. It's been treating hate speech, Article 20 of the ICCPR, as just a permitted restriction and on freedom of expression, not as a standalone issue. I think that's the key way. Um, I'm just going to mention briefly the where I think another uh, human rights body is failing on this is the European Court of Human Rights. I know you heard from Anne Weber more details yesterday. But, um, and to start with to say, as a European human rights lawyer, I think the European Court of Human Rights is the most powerful human rights body in the world. It has achieve more than any other human rights body with hundreds of thousands of cases which are listened to, it's set in extraordinary jurisprudence. Um, but in Europe, we sometimes only go to the European Court of Human Rights and to know that there's other bodies out there. From my side, having worked on issues there for years, um, it's strong on some areas of law. The areas it's been weak traditionally and still is, I think, is on freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and equality and anti-non-discrimination. And that's, I think, was shown in, just to highlight the most recent case you heard of, um, ES v. Austria. This is the Austrian case um, from a few weeks ago where <clears throat> a person in Austria was convicted after talking about um, the Prophet Muhammad or his, um, pedophilia, etc., but um, was convicted essentially of, of um, upsetting religious feeling, I can't remember the exact law. So the European Court of Human Rights looks at this and says this conviction was acceptable, did not violate freedom of expression um, because there was a right of others in the country to have their religious feelings protected, and this is going through an English translation, and this conviction in Austria served the legitimate aim of preserving religious peace in Austria. Um, both those are problematic. If you put it at the UN 
standards. Um, neither of those are legitimate reasons. Protect, um, having religious feelings protected, what does feeling mean? It's a very subjective term. You need a very clear legal term. Um, and preserving religious peace is again another very vague term. Um, but this to me, without going into all the details now, reflects a problem with the European Court. Um, the European Convention of Human Rights, which it's based on, is an old document. It's only it dates from 1950. It's very generic. Um, so it doesn't, it has a freedom of expression article, it does not have a provision essentially on hate speech and incitement. Um, it means that the European Court of Human Rights over the years and the many cases it has, has to create its own precedents, its own duties. But when it goes wrong, the European Court of Human Rights, um, it, it sometimes often discontinues if a mindset goes wrong. And it has done that with blasphemy, with religious um, feelings, as it's now called. This goes back to a case I think you heard about yesterday called Otto Preminger Institute um, from some years ago. So that was about Christian feelings being upset. Um, but it essentially has taken this uh, vague area of hate speech, has not made it precise, has ended up upholding blasphemy laws which are based on offence and has actually upheld the provision that um, being offensive, being upsetting is grounds against others is grounds for criminalization. I would say that's particularly dangerous. Um, partic I, will, again, I will put the dividing line as offense. Um, criminalizing something for being offensive is extremely dangerous for freedom of expression rights. Um, you, freedom of expression means the power to offend. Um, but it has to be that if you're going to criminalize something that it should be something much more limited, that sort of incitement to violence and hatred. Of course, that incitement, criminalized hate speech, can may well be offensive. It's only a limited area of it. But a general criminalization of something for being offensive is extremely dangerous because many areas of speech can be offensive. Um, <clears throat> so that's where the, but the European Court started this when the case, probably 30 years ago now, I can't remember the year it was. And rather than move out and take note of, say, the UN developments and elsewhere, when it's in a hole, it just keeps digging and can make another case as well. It used to be criticized that the only time it took up an issue of offending religious sensibilities was with the Christian religion. It didn't do with Islam. Now it's done it with Islam, but has reinforced the problem, I think. Um, <clears throat> there's other problems with the European Court as well, as you just briefly with, you see with the, uh, it now upholds the criminalization of um, women wearing the veil in France and others, which the UN Human Rights Committee has said is a violation of freedom of religion and freedom of expression. But again, it's using the same, I would say, made up standard at the European Court of, well, then it's called living together, or religious, as it's did in the last case, religious peace, that not upsetting people in a country is grounds for restricting their rights. Um, so that's why I think the European Court on some issues is going in the wrong direction. This is not the rest of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe itself has a lot of good standards. But um, I would say one thing, don't necessarily rely on the European Court of Human Rights to set the highest standard. And then briefly, just to look at, um, in this context, the EU um, the Council Framework Decision 913. Um, that's one of offences concerning racism and xenophobia. And just looking at the very wording of that, that was in 2008, so some years before the UN Rabbi Plan of Action. But uh, certainly looking at it now by that, holding it to that UN standard, um, the, I'm not going to read all of it, but just a little bit of the um, framework decision, which obviously requires, essentially requires states to criminalize um, certain action. It says that the state shall ensure the following intentional conduct is punishable. So that's important, so it has to be intent. And the first one is um, publicly inciting to violence or hatred directed against a group of persons or members of such a group defined by reference to race, color, religion, descent, or national ethnic origin. That's a slightly more limited than the UN um, standard in Article 20, but includes areas like publicly inciting 
you could argue what's public today, um, especially in the age of social media. Um, but again, I think that fits in with the UN standard. There's certain other crimes within the framework which are a bit more, let's say, potential to be problematic. Because the rest of it, say, there's two which say, publicly condoning, denying, or grossly trivializing crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, as either first defined in the International Criminal Court or later in the Nuremberg Tribunal. When, but then it, that is a whole discussion in itself as to whether, say, what's on genocide denial should be criminalized. But then it's got a more limitation to say when the conduct is carried out in a manner likely to incite to violence or hatred against a minority group. So that sort of fits in with it, except this word in likely to incite. Does that mean intent or not? So by the UN standards, it needs to be intent. By the preliminary wording of this, of the framework, it should be intentional. Um, again, from my point of view, it's just much easier to say let's criminalize a very specific area, which is incitement, recognizing in some cases, even things such as denying crimes against humanity, genocide, could actually be intended to incite violence and hatred against the group and have an intent to do so. I think in limited cases. Um, we can think of many countries in Europe where even the state is still denying, grossly trivializing crimes against humanity, genocide committed by that country's forces, either recently or in their imperial past, um, which are probably very unlikely to be um, incitement. So I think there's still remains a problem in that, and that it's, um, again, this can only be seen in the action, in an overall framework of freedom of expression as the start, limitations on freedom of expression have to be very precise, very limited, very proportionate. So going forward on this, I would say as Europeans, um, or those working in Europe, um, it's, there's diff knowing there's different standards. At the moment, some of the dynamism has been, I think, in trying to bring, address, properly address hate speech uh, that amounts to incitement within freedom of expression has, has been done at the UN. Um, not to necessarily rely on the Strasbourg, the, Council, the Court of Human Rights jurisprudence as the gold, gold standard, the go-to standard. And how the EU laws will come into force is knowing the EU, of course, now has still rather unused Charter on Fundamental Rights and that using the Charter on Fundamental Rights to develop that and litigate that and use it by that going to the highest standard, which includes the UN, and not when it comes to issues like freedom of expression, relying on the, um, on the Strasbourg jurisprudence. So that would be my summary, and repeat again, I just recommend those interested at the UN go and read the Rabbi Plan of Action, but happy to discuss any issues that come up, including how to apply this to social media. Thank you.